So hi everyone, just wanted to welcome everyone to the second part of our evolution of the service desk series. So this one's going to be a roundtable discussion focusing on what frontline IT services look like in a post COVID world. So some of the key things we're going to be focusing on is working from home and onboarding, empowering the customer with access to knowledge, leading teams in the new model and how companies have reacted differently to COVID, getting the most out of collaboration tools and then building a service that is future proof. So you also might notice that since our last event, we've rebranded and combined our London and Manchester infrastructure groups. So obviously this is a virtual event, but in future we're going to plan to do these more face to face. So keep an eye out for them. But to get started with today's discussion, first off, I'm Beth. So just to give a little intro to myself. I head up the service management function here at Expertise. And then this evening, I've been joined by Bavin, Francis and Glenn. So if you guys just wanted to start off by introducing yourself, Francis, perhaps if you wanted to lead the way with that. Uh, I'm Francis. Um, I, can't, I was at a, a, a managed service provider as an Office 365 Premier Team Lead, but I've picked up a new role in the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sports in, in the segment of the government. And, I manage the service desk function there, the tech bar function, and we're looking at onboarding a uh, transitioning a uh, first line support function to just obviously complete the whole tech support function. Cool. I'll go next. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so, my name is Bavin. I'm currently uh, working at uh, Cloud Stratex in a role of uh, everything to do with uh, service now, uh, whether that's uh, helping customers on their journey, uh, if they're existing customers, or moving away from other platforms into service now and actually bringing those aspects of people, process, and technology together to de deliver um, service. Um, at the moment, I'm seconded for a few months to London Stock Exchange, which is an interesting, uh, interesting journey uh, on, on its own. Uh, but yeah, um, lots of experience in terms of um, service, service uh, management aspects, service desk, and and how bringing those transformational bits together. Hi, um, I'm Glenn Curry. Uh, currently, I'm well. I'm a consultant who goes into various organisations. I'm currently with Royal Mail, um, working in their service management team, managing their um, operations and parcels portfolio, which means I'm responsible for making sure you will get your Christmas mail this year. Um, so I'm running running a team and a whole raft of services in the front line for Royal Mail over the Christmas period and into next year. Um, 20 odd years experience around in ITIL service management, particularly specialising in setting up and growing service desks and remote support teams at a global level. OK, brilliant. So I think kicking off the discussion, we'll start with one of the most prevalent things I think at the moment post COVID is obviously working from home, how this has changed onboarding. So how has working from home and onboarding changed in your guys' opinion in obviously this post COVID world and then moving forward with that? Um, I'll go first. Um, we've had to kind of change the viewpoint on how we provide service to the organisation. I mean, everybody's now getting accustomed to or getting comfortable with the, the hybrid working. So there's there's not really that much need or for for an on-site team per se. We've, we've got a, a tech bar function where we've got a solid foundation of when people want to stroll into the office and have a quick appointment and then dip back out and decide to go back home and continue their working from home. But as for the, the onboarding, it's a, you have to ensure that you have a, a streamlined process. Uh, we tend to obviously send the, our kit out to our new starters before they begin the we begin within the organisation. And we have a, a remote onboarding process where we have a group of new starters um, at the beginning of each week that come into a session and we walk them through onboarding and rolling them into their, to their work devices. Whereas in the past, it was um, hey child, we would heavily get involved in this kind of process and um, taking the new starters around the organization, getting them accustomed to the culture and then um, offloading them to the IT team where they will have a face to face interaction with, with the IT team. We're slightly different now. So it's all about 
focusing on what's the best processes on, uh, on working remotely and supporting remotely. It's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, how uh, something like a pandemic has had um, a significant shift away from what used to be a stigma of uh, really you want to work from home or you know it used to be a big no-no in terms of remote working um but actually the the industry has demonstrated that it is possible um you know uh, as i said it is it's a significant shift on on the way that, that the the i guess the old school thinking was happening but we are now very much in this mindset of actually we have to put trust and empower our, our teams and our employees um, to be able to to deliver the service and actually get the get the um, the, the jobs that they are in, brought in to do done right. Um, so the significant shift also leads to things like flexibility, right? So additional flexibility is there, and it, it's everywhere I turn uh, throughout the pandemic. One thing that that I've, I'm hearing consistently is. <clears throat> People tend to be working harder whilst they are working remotely, um, which is whether it's to, in terms of delivering uh, more uh, or putting in more hours, or whether it's um, putting in um, a lot more effort um, because suddenly you're not commuting. Uh, you, you know, you gain all that time. So what a what a shift! Um, you know, this has uh, this pandemic has driven us to. Glenn, anything? Yeah, I think you, know, you say you think you're right. There. I think it's, it's definitely moved and shifted um, things in a different direction. I think I'd like, you know, one of the things that um, Francis mentioned was about you know, talking about onboarding. And I think one of the things, particularly when you talk about service desks, you talk about you know, frontline services and that kind of thing with onboarding of staff. It's a whole new ball game, and it really does really have to be, as you say, Francis, a really really slick operation because it, because the now it really is a game of first impressions whereas before people could rock up and just pick up their laptop and get away with working they expect to be working from day one because they don't really want to be sitting at home doing nothing and so you really need a really slick operation a really good onboarding process because as a, as, as, as as various different companies are seeing if you don't do it people will will, will, will vote with their feet i i went to a company um not the company I'm currently with, or not the company before. I went to a company before that, and their onboarding process was horrendous. It was absolutely horrendous, and it really did leave a really bad taste and a really set the pre-determination of how I felt about that company. And I think you know, in this day and age, it is so important. Um, you know, on the on the more wider point of flexible working. Yeah, I think, Bavin, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Productivity, it, particularly in the IT sector, has, has, has gone through the roof. And also because new projects, new ways of working are just, you know, it's just incredible. I mean, the Royal Mail, Royal Mail at the moment, and they're having to you know, really reevaluate how they do everything. And, you know, you, you don't think of it sometimes, you know, but, but for instance, you know, the PDAs that the post, the postman use, they're having to provide extra functionality in those and to take pictures to make sure because the customers are asking now, can you take a picture of something before when we leave it on somebody's doorstep? So particular customers are asking for that. That's brand new functionality within what is a traditional manual industry. And that leads IT teams to be stretched even more, which means more and more hours and this flexible way of working where people are mainly at home. It's not just a question of choice. I think people are being forced to work much more hours than they used to work. Agility has gone up, would you agree, yes. uh, Glenn? Because uh, of what you just described, right? So suddenly we've, we've had to innovate. We've had to think on our, our mm. feet on, on how do we service our customers better how do we serve our own teams better and and therefore you know chucking out um, or, or throwing out new new ways of working regularly i think has has increased certainly from what I, what i'm seeing um as well and, and it's a uh, what, learning curve as well because some of the stuff in doesn't work and it has to be re-engineered so it's there's, there's, <laughs> it's a really it's quite bumpy in places and, and it's the frontline teams that have got to deal with all the issues. The service desks have got to deal with all the issues. Um, you know, 
it's it's really interesting to see how things are evolving and seeing in some ways those that can sink and those that can swim. Okay, I think another topic of discussion that we were, were going to cover was, I guess, empowering the customer with access to knowledge. So how the customers access the knowledge now they're all based from home, how that might have changed. Um, previous, I mean, in any organisation, you, you, your your IT department, your tech support department, and you, you are at the forefront of just communications in any sense. But Coming to now the whole functionality of working from home, um, what we tend to go by is uh, a self-service pool, what we kind of use. Uh, we have to ensure that one, like knowledge database is regularly up to date. Uh, two, off the jump from when we get our new starters is about making sure we um, imprint that culture of, even though we have a tech support function here. Um, this is how we work in service now. If you have an issue, this is a knowledge or the logic behind service now can actually pull knowledge articles for the actual user rather than wasting the user's time and waiting for a response. How can I uh, access a certain file? How can I print once I get into the office? Boom, there's the documentation there. So the empowerment of the customer right now is is one of the main focuses I feel is for a tech support function because it beats out a lot of the crap kind of requests or incidents that may come into the service desk. What we tend to look at across several departments is um, looking for key members of certain departments where we can actually transfer knowledge to them where we feel as if um, so many types of incidents have been raised and they can be actually knocked on the head for um, rather than coming directly to the service desk. You can go to your super user in your particular department where they hold a certain amount of knowledge and they can cascade that knowledge across their teams and so on. It's interesting, isn't it, uh, Francis, what you described there and, and dependency there is on, on kind of individuals in teams to impart with the knowledge as well, right? Because it's kind of sitting in people's heads, uh, people potentially been there in, a, in an organization in a role for many, many years and, and they've been doing things in a certain way and now all of a sudden they've got to impart that knowledge so that, you know, others in the organization, others in the enterprise can, can you know, utilize and leverage. Um, and actually, you know, I think this has led to a lot more collaboration between teams, right? Um, communication has gone up, collaboration between teams has, has gone up as a, as a result and collaboration therefore with the entire enterprise, um, kind of trying to understand actually what are your needs? What does the business need and how can we make it efficient uh, in terms of supporting yourselves? Whether it's IT knowledge being shared with them or whether it's knowledge from other departments like HR, common functions that like, like HR or finance, you know, um, which would be really, really powerful where all these uh, knowledge repositories are are shared and, and knowledge articles are tagged correctly so that, you know, somebody can go to a, a portal like you described, Francis, and, and kind of find help uh, with ease. I think a lot of people in their personal lives are kind of used to it, but Surprisingly, you know, through the pandemic, I've seen some enterprises who hadn't, let's say, adopted knowledge, uh, you know, or, or prioritized knowledge uh, sharing as a, um, uh, as a as a process or a program of work, uh, kind of for a bit in, on the back burner um, in, in regards to the, the employee experience, I think. Um, I just when I thought the question, I looked at it in a slightly different way as well in that away from KT, away from knowledge and knowledge sharing and all that kind of stuff when we think when we look at user demand and when we look at what customers need i think the real area as well where we've seen so much growth is automation and the use of automated tools bots that kind of thing i think you know i think frontline support is having to adapt at a rapid um, change of pace. I was back uh, four years ago, I was with Arm 
and we were putting together a project to set up a service desk um, with a particular managed service provider and you know, we spent time out in India and some of the stuff there which was brand new technology then is now commonplace with you know intelligent AI bots and stuff like this and you know proactive proactive healing and stuff like this this is just standard stuff now and that's the journey for that has accelerated so much as the demand from customers to be able to get their work done in this new way of of doing things um has become far far more important i think to add to that um glenn said something on your first question it's about mm -hmm. um the first first impression uh, that's why during this kind of we're doing an onboarding for like a first line transition from a third party and it's very essential that we get this transition period on point again first impression from all the organization um, the point of contact we got is through teams through phones through chat box um, as um, Nadine previously said and um, Glenn said um, it's very important that we don't kind of throw our customers off the actual culture of the tech support. We, we even though we, we do cascade knowledge to certain super users across several departments, we don't want to put our customers in a position where they, they can't, they don't, they don't want to feel that they can't reach out to their tech support. Trying to use um, as, as late as technology as possible. So this is, this is where it becomes difficult as well, because you have to also empower your customers to try and resolve their issues as well as bring your tech support function in line with current day-to-day -day technologies and then cascade that technologies to your customer and trying to make their 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 kind of tech support journey as smooth and easy as possible. It's the adoption, isn't it? And, and I think uh, I, it's only in, in the last two, two roles that I've been in, I think the rate of adoption has been phenomenal. The the appetite from from the customer or from the the user base has been, you know, really really good in terms of you know, yes, this is what we asked for. This is what we we needed, and actually our life is getting more and more easier. I don't have to pick up the phone now or or jump on a on a chat. You know, I can just find my information um, on on this portal. But you know, a few years ago to to get users or end users to get to a portal was a challenge in itself, right? Now suddenly we're all there, um, which is which is interesting as well, I think. I think there's also an element, and I think Francis will pick up on you again. I think there's also an element that you'll never you'll never lose the human touch though, because what you're what you're finding is you're you're finding a much wider user base. Because that's a, there's a subtlety there as well in that you know whereas before you'd have certain types of people that may be quite tech savvy working on laptops in offices and working on desktops in offices now everyone gets given a laptop everybody's sitting at home everybody's connecting up to their wi-fi and everybody needs support so your whole demographic of users who you are supporting is much wider as well which requires a much you know that is why you'll never lose that human touch because you're always going to need that customer service support to deal with people that have very little in the way of IT knowledge or IT literacy. So there's always, you know, you can put in as much, automation does two things. It helps in some of that as well, but you never will lose that, that, that element. And this is where service desks need to be really good going forward. And I'm not going to name an organization, but I had quite an interesting conversation on a service review last week with a very large um, British organization that is having enormous problems with their service desks at the moment because they are not doing very well at that level and they need to put some quick fixes in quickly to actually raise their game um, because their customer satisfaction scores have dropped off a cliff in the last year two years so it's those that adapt that will survive mm -hmm. the question yeah, so go ahead I was going to say, I think we touched on it there a bit as well, was kind of a point for later, but we've touched on it already, the way that collaboration has changed. Now everyone's in separate locations and the different collaboration tools being used, and you touched on it there, Glenn, around the way we're going to use different tools, such as automation versus 
that human touch, how do you think moving forward, the way we use these tools is, is going to have an impact and what tools do you think are going to kind of remain important moving forward? I think you, you, your traditional collaboration tools just get better and better, don't they? You know, Teams has evolved itself. You know, a couple of years ago, we was all on Skype for business. Now we're all on Teams. And, you know, it's also how you use that tool, how it, how, and it's just not, not one tool. It's how everything's linked together, you know, in, in your whole Microsoft suites, your, whichever platform you're using, how well they are all linked together and how well people are able to use those. Um, you know, some people still always just use Teams as a chat um, facility. You know, we're all sitting on Teams now recording this session, um, but there's so much more to it and so many ways it can be used in this day and age um, and, the, and the functionality keeps growing. You know, I'm not the, the expert here, but you know, it's almost like weekly there's new iterations of these tools that people are going to continually be using. I feel as if it, it, it's, it's become the norm now. It's, it's part of your, your everyday life. Like as soon as you open up your device, one of the first, you don't even open up your emails anymore. You open up Teams first, or you open up uh, whatever type of collaboration tool you're using. Um, and I feel as if it, it it just seems to fit perfectly in the puzzle of making everything smoother and allowing everyone to work from home much smoother. Rather than, I mean, it's getting a bit uh, long winded trying to pick up a phone and reach out for someone. It's just like, let me just someone, send someone a quick message to see if they can give me a hand or so. So yeah. It's kind it's, of sorry. sorry go on. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. No, I think it's, it's interesting though that the different levels at which different companies have adopted the full functionality, you know. And I think I'm in an organisation at the moment where they're not even using the video at all. Nobody uses video. I was it's actually in a previous conversation and they've done the same thing. Like yeah. I went about six months managing. They used the conference calls. Yeah. They don't use the video, and I find that really, really strange because you know, every organisation I've been into recently is more, it's almost compulsory to show yourself on camera, but nobody goes on camera. So there's still a lot of differences in the way these tools are used. It's not like everybody is all of a sudden video conferencing left, right and centre. But, you know, um, it's just very, it's, some, some organisations I think will use the tools very traditionally, and some organisations will be much more innovative in the way they use use them. Yeah, we we're I think at Cloud Stratex we are a bit of uh, on the latter side of that, Glenn, and and we're doing. There is no need for SharePoint. Basically, we are doing we're using it as a as a, a real sharing collaborating um, mechanism, and actually it works really really well. Um, and I think there's that feeling of inclusivity, you know, because you, as you were saying, Francis, you, you you log on and it's there in front of you. It, I guess it replaces that, you know, morning coffee side conversation with your with your teammates, and and you, you know you're there. Everybody's there, and everybody feels inclusive. I think team leaders and supervisors have probably have to had to change their mindsets in terms of how do we manage our teams, how do we work with our teams better through these tools and that also is a is a bit of a shift in in thinking and kind of ways of working um which, which is uh yes we've talked about um uh, increased uh, productivity but you know going back to what i was saying before as well it's it's that trust as well yeah it's uh glenn you know maybe they're not going on the camera because they're on the pjs right they're in yeah. the pjs still you know but it's having that mindset of or, or even setting the policies to say right if you're on the mm. call video on policy right um you just do that i think we, we talk about it in a while but i think it's a double-edged sword as well though because the tools can be an asset but they can also be um especially when managing teams and being careful with regards to overload. And, you know, you spend your whole life sitting in teams calls and you never get any of your day job done. And that's, I, I, I know that's a theme for a lot of people at the moment, 
that the you know, your calendar is blue from eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night and where do you actually find the headspace to actually get a job done and it's so easy now just to lump in a meeting it's not like you know oh nine to five anymore it's eight o'clock till six o'clock meeting after meeting people don't take traditional lunch breaks so you can just stick a meeting whenever you want to at whatever time and in the end people are just completely overloaded with 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 the amount of meetings so it can be it's very it's i still think we've got a long way to go learning getting the balance right on how we use these tools and i think as leaders it's very important as well that we're in touch with our teams to make sure how they're being overloaded and what they're actually doing uh, absolutely right I'd, I'd agree with that and then but yeah, burnout is a is a massive thing uh, out there at the moment. You know, people are under under pressure because suddenly you've got teams on your on your mobile devices, and you know that expectation of you know actually let me just quickly reply to this, or you know oh, they're online, so let me just ping them. You know, actually let's let's apply that balance. And and as you said, Glenn, it's really important to check in with with the teams, make sure that you know they're okay, and as individuals and and as a team holistically as well. I think leading on from this as well, I guess, in general, moving forward in this new model, how do you lead the teams and how do you lead a service desk? Obviously, we've touched on it there, the, the hours and the way meetings are being booked in and making sure people don't burn out. So what are your thoughts on how we lead teams, how we lead service desks moving forward in this new sort of post-COVID world? Um, I, I go by notion of, of trust. I, I give ultimate trust to the team and they're obviously the main focus is to instill that the culture of what we do is supporting the business so regardless at the end of the day you're you're here for a particular shift this is this is what's coming in through the tech support function this is what's coming in through service now this is the ticketing system these are our goals these are our kpis and as a collective team it's the the mindset of having a family orientated team as one so it's like we've got a goal to achieve now i don't have an issue of how you handle your day for i care you could be in you could have breakfast in the morning in a calf you've got teams on your phone i don't have a don't have a barnage you could have lunch down the road in a chinese shop but at the end of the day it's when we're all coming together as a team what have we achieved our kpis um customer satisfaction satisfaction from the business where is it have we improved on that so it's all about the trust for the team and it's the family orientated mindset the fact that we all need to get our hands dirty and make sure we give a, a decent enough tech support to the organization i think that links back to some of the points we've, we've talked about um earlier on it's communication fostering of kind of knowledge sharing as well right within within the team um, empowering, empowering the the teams and enabling some planning as well, right? So one of the things uh, we are doing at the moment, for example, as a, as a kind of pilot, in, you know, Glenn, you mentioned kind of meetings and slotting meetings. In actually, do we really need a meeting for meeting sake, you know, or is it just a conversation? Pick up the phone, have the convo, and get it out of the way. Um, or if you're putting in a meeting, make it clear in the agenda what the meeting is about. You, so so many people. Um, many organizations, there's this culture of actually meetings go in, there's no clear understanding of what the meeting's about, what the expectation is going to be, who's going to be the, doing the talking, um, and actually what, what the outcomes are. So what we're trialing is um, every meeting invite goes in with some sort of table that says, okay, this is what the meeting's about, this is the purpose of, of the meeting, this is what we're expecting to talk about. Here are all the individuals who are participating. We, you know, and and these are the individuals who are going to talk for an amount of time, just to kind of set the scene a little bit and and enable the meeting to be productive. And you know, setting up meetings so that they don't send reminders um, 15 minutes before. Why not send it 10 minutes before, for example, or end meetings um, five minutes before the top of the hour or half past the hour to allow people to get a bit of a breather before the next one, right? Um, so these are types of things we, we're kind of putting in place. I guess you could call it meeting etiquette uh, to a certain to a certain degree, but it's it's around we've got the technology, as Glenn said, but how do we make the most of it to 
to be efficient and actually effective as well to somewhere um, get 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 breathing space. Mm. Yeah, again, I, I I keep doing this, taking a totally different look at things, and I, I, I keep with all this, and I may have mentioned it on our previous session. The opportunity space is that you you've also got this chance when you're leading teams to be able to bring a wider breadth of knowledge in a different kind of type of people in than you would traditionally have as you're not tied to geographical location anymore. Um, you have the ability now to manage, which brings its own challenges as well, because you're managing in a much more global environment than you were before. Instead of just a local, you've got a team in a set location, um, wherever you could now have a team working for you where you know you've got one person in china one person in africa one person in south america another person in alaska you know you you you, you the, the the whole dynamic of managing teams and what that requires of us as leaders has changed and, and, and new leaders coming through of having a much more multicultural multi geographical viewpoint on the world um and multi-skilled as well would you say glenn sorry multi-skilled as well right so suddenly suddenly your skill requirements for a specific job i think mm. you know, or specific role you're looking at a little bit more than you used to before right yes yep you you, you definitely are because you can you can remix you can have a team under you now that is in such because of the way way we work you can see things much more in twin than you could before instead of being so siloed things things are much more that you can get that kind of end-to-end -end view with the way in which you can have teams together um it creates its own challenges um but uh but coming back to you i will pick up on your meeting things i think one of the most important things for me about meetings is you make sure you come out with actions I think one of the big things you're going to meet and you might have an agenda, but whether or not you'll actually come out of any meaningful actions is another thing. And I think for me, it's really important doing that. I love the Jeff Bezos view in that you shouldn't need the amount of people you invite to a meeting should never be more than what you could feed two pizzas with. <laughs> Everyone does their pre read before they turn up to the meeting and no meeting lasts more than half an hour. That's my kind of attitude towards meetings. I agree. I fully agree. I mean, what Glenn said about the geographical restrictions. I mean, if if I see a meeting that has got um, content that requires my input, then I feel okay. Yeah, that I allow that to sit in the calendar and that can take a chunk of my day out. But I go by an open door policy. If you can see my my status and available, uh, you can feel free to give me a quick buzz and we can have five, 10 minute chat and then that's my meeting done for the day. But it has to have value. A meeting has to have value. I've been away from, and you guys maybe answer to answer this question for me. I've been a little bit away from service desks the last you know couple of years now, since I left Johnson Matthew really. Um, how are you guys finding it? Are, are service desks still working remotely? Or yep. uh, is it you? I predicted, and I, I sat down. And I think I mentioned it in the previous session we had. You know, I predicted that this would lead to leading service desks in a different way, and that you've got this wider pool of resource that you can recruit from. That you know, I always said that you know the challenges we had when me and you, Babin, were at Johnson Matthews, whether or not mm. we'd be Polish speakers yep. on a service desk in in Middlesbrough. You know, in this or in or in Kuala Lumpur, have you? Know, from your point of view, are those rules going out the window now? Are you able to you know think about bringing people in in different ways in different geographical locations to be one sort of hybrid team? Most definitely. So some of those rules are definitely going going out of the window, right? A, a lot of recruitment we're doing um, is through LinkedIn as a, as a platform. Uh, and I think that's common for a lot of um, a lot of um, businesses out there. And what LinkedIn does is is that it advertises it globally. So we we typically get applicants from anywhere in the world. And actually, we are not precious of where they're based um, within reason. As long as they're able to provide the skills and and capabilities that we need close enough in the in the time zone that we need. 
I think we are very, very open to kind of having those those candidates interviewed. So, um, yeah, it's it's definitely changing, Glenn, um, from from what what it used to be. Um, I also, just to add to that, there is a bit of a hybrid um, ways of kind of working in some organisations I've seen where. The, the, the way the rotation of the shift kind of takes place is some members of the team will be remote at some time and some will be coming on site just to enable that flow of actually and keep alive that feeling of being in a place of work um, as well. That's why I think it's very it's vital that organizations uh, consider the idea of a tech bar function. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like you don't need an appointment to come and see tech and there's always that reliability of an engineer on site if I have an issue with my device because regardless your engineers are remote we have that remote function in place yeah we can help you remotely but if you want to have a sense of working in a building there's also a tech support function there. Okay, and I think leading on from this as well, and you've kind of mentioned it there in the way your different organisations are dealing with things after COVID, what would you say are the different ways companies have reacted to COVID, whether that be reactively, proactively? What do you think the positives and negatives are of these different approaches, I guess? I feel it's, it's shocking. Like some, some of uh, my previous colleagues in other organisations, um, it's shocking to hear that some organisations haven't even progressed as far as you would think and are encouraging their members of staff to actually come to the office and work 100% from the office where like you, you, we're talking about life in general is is all about remote working like an example um, of, of Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse that he's recently talking about the experience of going into a, a different type of, I don't know, universe and interacting with people again remotely. There's no sense of being in a building. And I think it is, it's becoming outdated of having to go to uh, somewhere where it's uh, bricks and cement to sit down at a desk and so on. So it's now adjusting your work life into your actual life per se. So it's become one rather than or I go to work, but work is now with me, if you understand what I'm saying, it's my time. I think it, organizations have, uh, in, in different sectors, depending on, on, on different sectors, have all kind of reacted in a, in a unique way um, or, or adapted in a, in a unique way. Those that had, I guess, invested in, in technology prior, they are, they are ahead of the curve a little bit, those who haven't are maybe still catching up or those who are still in that mindset of actually we don't need to invest uh, you know as Francis what you're describing then they're, they're still behind the curve I think where where the innovation and the the, the upskilling has happened I think those companies have kind of really really gone quite far in terms of what they are delivering to their customers and if they're not able to to keep up with um, servicing their customers using the technologies that are available to them and adapting to, to the ways of working. I mean, look at the number of businesses we've seen over the last two years that have gone under, um, not being able to kind of manage or, or keep up or actually even invest, right? Because suddenly customers were moving from where the nice to haves were to actually the luxury space where, oh no, this is all by default on this side, so I'm going to go over there and, and get my money's worth, let's say. Um, it's um, certainly in the, you know, in the hospitality industry, you know, those kind of little cafes, restaurants, they didn't adapt to things like picking up <clears throat> delivery um, ordering or uh, some of these uh, fast food delivery services. If they didn't adapt, then they're kind of struggling a little bit. So it's really, really interesting in terms of how different organizations have have really reacted. And I think something to you know, link back to what we were saying earlier on is, is the type of thinking that the, the leadership of the organization also has, right, in terms of driving that thought process. OK, this avenue is blocked for us. What are we going to do now? Because uh, how are we going to service our customers and so on and so forth? It's been it's been interesting to see some of um, some of the innovations out there. 
I think the other thing for me which separates organisations in this sort of post-COVID world, which brings an awful lot of what we've talked about together, is the big word that everybody uses now is well-being. Um, and I think it's how different companies actually use that word, because I think it's the companies that are realising their staff are their greatest commodity. And we've talked a little bit about how ways of working have changed and about how behaviours have changed, how we're everyone's over productivity. I think those companies that coming out of you know, in this post pandemic world that really aren't just paying lip service to the word well being, but actually in living, living and breathing that are going to be the companies that really are successful going forward. Because I think what 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 this is doing is it's making ironically companies much more people companies much have to be much more people focused because they have to think about their people more because their people aren't in front of them all the time and i think those companies that really and it's not about monetary investment but really invest in the philosophy of well-being and really helping their staff move forward on this which for everybody is a new journey are going to be the ones that are really going to be successful. I think moving forward then perhaps as a potentially final discussion point, sort of moving forward post COVID as we carry on, how do we build a service that is future proof carrying on moving forward? Um, it stems off something of, of, of something of what Babbitt said earlier on is um, the focus on the leadership of the organization and where they kind of want to go. The focus is on uh, using uh, uh, technology to, to its fullest potential like, and looking at your technology stack to see if it's enough for the actual shift in how uh, working, the hybrid working is going on now or what's, what's the next idea or what possible collaboration tools can we bring into the organization to advance this shift? And then on top of that is the discussion of what we spoke about earlier on. Apart from the technologies and where we need to go, go to is about the empowerment, how we're going to ensure that uh, our customers are will be or are going to be ready for this, this shift of technology that we're going to bring into the organization. And then bringing in what Glenn said as well, at the people focus, how are people going to contribute towards this support in supporting our customers. So there's a few key points about looking across for post post um, COVID support. I think, Glenn, I think you mentioned it earlier, you know, use of um, automation, right? So how do we how do we build something that's that's simple enough to to consume with for our for our consumers. That's that's all highly automated. That's simple, but actually fast. And then build it with enough resilience so that suddenly, when tomorrow there is a lockdown and you have to work from home, actually it will still function, right? And and um, it's still generating the the value that you you were see seeking when you actually were trying to respond to create this this service. So it's it's really Really interesting how the thinking behind the design of a, of a service has also changed a little bit in terms of, you know, suddenly, you know, just going back to resilience, how, how many people are now paying more attention to, you know, how do we build continuity in, in our services? You know, when the pandemic hit, how many companies do you think were out there that were actually ready to say, oh, no, our service desk can work from home? There were many that weren't ready for stuff like that, and the lockdowns hit, and and suddenly they were scrambling. As Glenn was saying to to get laptops out there. There was a shortage of devices, and suddenly today we we've learned a lot over the last two two and a bit years, and and we are starting to build those in into the, the new ways of working and new ways of delivering service to to our customers, which is in what I have seen more recently also is that's resonating across the enterprise. It's not just in the technology stack or the, the technology arena, it's across the enterprise from from HR, finance, you know, everybody providing a service. Think about facilities departments or 
you know departments that look after you you know your office desks and your office space you know how do they enable the ways of working um with regards to allowing booking systems and so on and so forth so that you can go into the office and and be still protected and provisioning of hand sanitizer etc so i think uh, you know what we've talked about thus far all of it kind of combined leads to a, a new way of designing and, and building and, and delivering a service really Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think this, the key things for me are, which which you know, you guys have already picked up on, is pace. I think it's it, yeah. I think the companies that can work at pace because the world is moving so fast. It's you know, it, it, it's moving much faster now post pandemic. It was moving fast then, you know. But I think it's just an increasing velocity of change. I think companies that are able to. Um, adapt to that change with agility and pace are going to be the company the companies that are successful and I think from a, you know, from a service point of view that is the same I think you know as we see with vital four we move much more into talking about things you know DevOps is now commonplace that that, that puts a whole new spin on on how we manage services and I think you know as I say you just can't forget the human the human part of the part of the equation as well and the ability to make sure that we're giving our people the tools that we're managing their well-being and we're just managing them and helping them um, evolve in their careers as well is how, how we're going to be successful going forward. I think as we're, we're sort of wrapping up, I think, yeah, the, the conversation, it seems moving forward, it's how all these things that we've discussed all tie in together, the way the homework in the onboarding, how you're leading your teams, how you're implementing collaboration tools are all coming together to how we're going to move forward in the future with building think, a service and how we're operating our teams. I think it's really fascinating. We, you know, and again, it sums up how much life has changed. We wouldn't, we wouldn't even be two years ago at this time. We weren't even having these conversations. Mm -hmm. Fully agree. Where we're we not having these conversations at all. If you'd have said, right, I'm going to send the majority of my staff to work at home, you would have been said you'll start raving mad <laughs> um, or, or somebody might be saying you know putting you on a, on a firing line somewhere right <laughs> yeah exactly it, <laughs> it, the agenda has changed and i think coming out of this i think i think everybody both in personal and business lives have got to think you never know what's going to happen and you've got to in some ways you've got to prepare for you never know what's going to happen it's hard but that's what, what we've got to do and that's what we have to do in, 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 in our world as well. Think about the things that we can't think of. Yeah, and I think on touching on that where two years ago we weren't expecting this to happen, I think it's interesting to think the way all companies have adapted and we had to move towards this new model, what would have happened if this hadn't happened? Would we have still been in the same situation where five days a week in the office was the norm and all your service desks were sat in an office? if that would still be the case now or if things may have naturally evolved I without would, COVID? I think it would have been. I think, you know, you you were planning, you know, you, you were planning service service desks in, in central locations. Um, there was no thoughts of, you know, myself and Babin were in a company where we were, you know, the, the whole operating model was moving to investment in a particular geographical centre of a whole operation center and service desk within one geographical location that has completely gone out the window with these companies now um it's just incredible how much thinking has had to change and we'll probably never go back that way you know i, I don't see a day where you know i don't see the the days where everybody is commuting monday to friday back in offices ever happening. Agreed. I mean, uh, Beth, uh, in, in some of the recruitment we are doing, and, and you're probably seeing this, right? Uh, some of the first questions we get in an interview or even before the interview is, what is your flexibility policy? Um, and and uh, some of those things, I think, would not have changed if it weren't for the pandemic. We were forced into it. And actually, it's yes, it's brought a lot of negative, but there's a lot of positive that is coming out of this that will 
I think enable organizations to be even more successful as as they progress over the next few years. But yeah, there are definitely aspects that yes. we we were forced into and and uh, would not have changed if it weren't for the pandemic. That's a really interesting point because I'm a contractor at the end day season contractor and and you know that is one of the things you see on all the listings for contractors now that really they, they use remote working or hybrid working as the yeah. the leading selling point. Yeah, it's it's changed that much. And I, think, I just think, you know, so many things have changed. You know, it's like a few years ago, we'd all been traveling around the world. That won't happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Talk to your colleague now just by picking up a team's call. That's it. Yes, I think before we, we wrap up discussions, anyone got any last points, anything that they wanted to, to add before we, we wrap things up? No, I think from from the position, thank you. Yeah, very very good session. We've we've touched on a on a lot of points that are actually quite well interrelated, and and you know hopefully listeners of this um, uh, session will get some value out of it. And um, yeah, there's a lot of good things we've talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you guys so so much for your time this evening. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. bye.